We're going to be looking at a very famous artwork by Alfred Stieglitz and we're going to be looking at it in terms of a visual analysis. So first we're going to discuss it in terms of visual literacy, so we're going to look at the elements and principles, and then I'm going to look at it in terms of social meaning and how those elements and principles actually create an image that has deeper meaning than what is first observed. So for example, when we look at our elements and principles, you'll notice this bridge that goes along the center of the image at a diagonal and is of a very light color. It is, is pretty much a white sunlit bridge with rhythmic chain links that lead our eye from the left of the image all the way up to the right where we can view people standing up on the top deck. There are other diagonals in this image as well. If you look to the top left, you'll see a very sharp diagonal, a darker diagonal coming down to the bottom of the image. And if you look to the right, you'll see a middle staircase that also comes down at a very sharp diagonal. There's a horizontal across the image as well that separates the top half from the bottom half of the image. Then when you look at more specifics, you'll notice in the top that the background, the sky, is very light, it's, it's white. And the people in front of this backdrop are mostly in dark clothes with hints of light clothes sort of appearing out of this darkness. While if you move down to the bottom of the picture, there are definitely people wearing dark clothes, but it is the people wearing light clothes that really stand out against the background. So there's a real play of dark against light at the top and light against dark at the bottom. There's a difference in um, texture in the sense that in, a, in many ways the industrial metal of the ship is fairly smooth looking. We can tell perhaps that the the large beam to the left here is some sort of cylinder, but it, it's, it doesn't have any sort of patterns or wrinkles. While if you look at the people's clothes, there's a stark contrast. We start seeing wrinkles and shadows and a sense of softness. So we've got the hard machine age versus the soft humanity that's on the ship. I'm going to quickly read something that Alfred Stieglitz himself said about this image. He said there were men, women and children on the lower level of the steerage, the lower class deck of a steamship. The scene fascinated me, a round straw hat, the funnel leaning left, the stairway leaning right, the white drawbridge, its railings made of chain, white suspenders crossed on the back of a man below, circular iron machinery, a mass that cut into the sky, completing a triangle. I stood spellbound for a while. I saw shapes related to one another, a picture of shapes, and underlying it, a new vision that held me. So Stiglitz himself looked at this image in a very much in a visual literacy way, trying to understand it in terms of lights and darks, shapes and lines. But what, how can we look at this work in a more social commentary way? Well, in the old days, as if any of you have watched the movie Titanic, you would know that the poor people often were below deck. That is what they could afford. While people with more money, the upper classes, middle to upper classes, could afford to buy tickets to be on the upper levels. And they were more likely to be out in the sun, to have the nice restaurants and shops, and it was very much more of a open air experience. On the lower decks, it was more crammed. Uh, people did their own washing. You can see washing hanging at the bottom left. Uh, it was more a sense of sort of migrant migrant people, people of of a lower income. So in a sense this image just isn't isn't just about the visual dichotomy between dark against light and light against dark, 
but this dramatic drawbridge the white drawbridge and then the horizontal beam that is right across the the image they form separations between the classes so this picture is literally divided in two based on class and that's a very interesting way to look at at the picture in your journal, you're going to look at this intriguing image by Henri Cartier-Bresson. He is very well known for creating works that have a sense of narrative, a sense of a story, where you can look at it and start to make connections and deductions about what's going on. And I'm particularly fond of this one, uh, especially with the, the two older Greek ladies at the bottom and then the, the two sculptures at the top. So in your journal, you're going to state the name of this work and then you're going to write a very short paragraph about what this what the narrative what is the story that you perhaps could glean from this work and that will be your second journal entry for this lesson carrying on with cartier bresson there's some other images that he does very playful uh, very much about urban life and and people living people moving and again that ambiguity we're looking at a man who seems to almost be jumping you know walking on water uh, yet he is totally silhouetted out and we're not sure what's going on so again you could sit and start to try and make a story a narrative of this particular scene Dorothea Lange uh, very much has narrative in her work but hers is based on documentary she was in the States during the Great Depression and this particular image is of a migrant mother who worked in the fields to try and make enough money for her nine children and her husband has passed away so she was a single mom trying to feed her family and she had arrived at a pea farm only to be told that all the peas had frozen in the frost and had died and her tent is still set up there on the side of the field where Dorothea Lang found her and you can just get the sense of despair and helplessness and worry and believe it or not this woman's actually in her early 30s but she has the wrinkles and the, the weather-beaten face of, a, of an older woman and again you know the, a single mom of nine children you can imagine the the strain that must have been Lang also took images of uh, African workers and the, the life that they led as migrant workers and as very low paid workers. And during the Second World War, she took pictures of the Japanese citizens in the States that were wrenched from their homes and put into camps because America was at war with Japan. Now Edward Weston looked at his photography in a very different way. For him it was really a visual, much a visual literacy event. He was looking at photography as a visual experience. And he would take common things such as peppers and toilets and the human body. And he would enjoy the sensual curves you know the roundness of this toilet bowl the 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 highlights and the shadows and and the pepper just how it curls over on itself and uh, for him that in itself was worth taking pictures of Ansel Adams is an extremely famous photographer uh, many uh, coffee table books made of his work and he was particularly interested in sort of the untouched wild. He loved Yosemite Park and took many images there and he really advocated for the protection of the untouched forests and grasslands and mountains and he wanted to protect them from people who would come and destroy this land in order to build uh, on this on this property. More Ansel Adams. Again, his work, although he had a an environmentalist message, his work also very much about visual literacy. You can see the curves of the man-made benches here versus the sort of natural variegated tonality of the leaves in the top of the picture. The high contrast of black and white, which is very much an Ansel Adams signature. 
Lorna Simpson is a contemporary artist in the States. She takes photographs that very much deal with being a black woman in America, and she often puts text in her work. In this one, called The Water Bearer, she writes, She saw him disappear by the river. They asked her to tell what happened, only to discount her memory. What do you think this image is about? Think about it. We're going to have a quick look at color photography. Up until the early 1900s, color photography was really in a very infant stage and it was not viable to take color images right through the, the, the first decades of the century because the colors would fade so quickly. If any of you have ever looked in a color National Geographic from you know, maybe the 1930s or 40s, you'll see how the colors really change and how they have not maintained their their credibility. And so it, f color photographers really had to wait for technology to catch up to what they were trying to do. But believe it or not, many photographers actually did not condone color photography. They believed that black and white photography was the pure art and that color photography was some sort of bastardization of the genre. Joel Meyerowitz was a artist that was one of the first to really champion color photography and in his images of pretty pretty much everyday life he shows the beauty of things such as this porch where we have the complementary colors orange and blue creating this wonderful wonderful visual vibrancy and and of peel and i'm pretty certain that if this image was in black and white it wouldn't have as much of an effect on us so instead of focusing so much on value as the more traditional photographers had to, Meyerowitz was able to play around with the color wheel and start to introduce the the colors then and almost in a sense introduce more of a reality. Andreas Gursky is an artist who manipulates his imagery digitally to heighten color. So this image of the of the dollar store he's up the saturation of the colors so that they're extremely bright and it makes you start to wonder what all these candy colors are about and it becomes overwhelming and almost obnoxious in its use of color this brings me back to thinking about Dwayne Hansen's sculpture supermarket shopper both artists are probably dealing with the idea of commercialism and the excesses and, and the sense of too much that is going on in our modern society. Gursky, though, however, he loves to play with color and with pattern. You can see here these beautiful lines in both the left and the right images. He uses color to allow our eyes to bounce from one area to another. And he also uses repetition. We've got the umbrellas repeating right across the beach. And on the right, we have the windows repeating not only up and down, but across left to right and back again. Cindy Sherman is also a contemporary artist and instead of taking photos of things around her she actually takes photographs of herself and what she does is she likes to play with different stereotypes and different ideas so for example she will dress up in clothes to make herself for example on the left hand side look like an over eager uh, sun tanned Californian on the right hand side she's uh, referencing uh, religious iconography in particular the Madonna and child and she's used a prosthetic breast that's not her real breast and it's over exaggerated and almost silly looking on purpose and I'm not sure if this is why she did it but I've often looked at breasts in Renaissance paintings and they often look like the painter has never seen a real breast in real life because they usually are these very strange completely round attachments and I wonder if that's what Sherman was alluding to in this particular work.